Now, another way that we can see this trade-off between current and future reproduction is when we look at the variation that we see in the age at which organisms first become reproductively active or the age of, at maturity. At what age do they mature? So first of all, I want you to take a second and you can pause the video here and look at this graph and what, tell me what the relationship is between the mortality rate of all these different fish species and the age at which those species first reach maturity. So if there is really high mortality, so fish, those adults, are really unlikely to make it to the next age, well, that's when we see populations have a very young age at first maturity. They are maturing very early on. But in populations and species where we see very low rates of mortality or alternatively high rates of survival, we see those fish take much longer time to reach maturity. So they, they have a much later age of maturity. So there's obviously a pretty strong relationship between the chance of dying and the age at which an organism becomes mature. So why is that? Well, first of all, let's just start off by thinking about this choice that organisms have. You know, again, choice in quotation marks. Um, they can either start reproducing early or they can start reproducing late. Of course, they can start at it's a continuum. They could start at any time in between early and late. Um, but what's the benefit of waiting to reproduce? And so waiting to start reproducing when you are much older. If you don't reproduce early, if you wait until you are older or bigger, well, this leads to all these resources that you would have put into reproduction being freed up for other things like increasing your survival or allocating, you can allocate those resources to your own growth. And in many organisms, including uh, these fish here, so this is actually female size on the x-axis and number of eggs on the y and this relationship is among individuals of this darter here. What you can see from the graph is that as the females get bigger, the number of eggs they can produce is bigger. So if these fish wait longer until they get bigger to begin reproducing, the first time they reproduce, they're going to be able to reproduce more and, and lay more eggs. So because bigger organisms are often able to reproduce more, they have higher reproductive rates, because they, they're bigger, they tend to have more resources available later than to put into reproduction. Uh, that would tend to increase um, their future reproduction as long as they live long enough to enjoy the benefits of being bigger or older, um, which of course doesn't always happen. And because they, that doesn't always happen, sometimes we see organisms, instead of waiting uh, to reproduce, they mature very early and begin reproducing very early on in life. And again, this is very similar to the reason that you would see organisms reproducing a lot instead of not reproducing as much. Uh, so what's the benefit of maturing early? Well, one thing to remember is that if you die before you reproduce, your fitness is zero. You have no copies of your genes added to the gene pool and to the, in the next generations. So if you don't reproduce, you have zero fitness. If you reproduce early then, if you become mature early and you reproduce a lot, then that decreases your risk of dying before you have uh, reproduced at all. 
So if you wait to reproduce, the chance of dying before you reproduce is going to be much higher. So there is a benefit of maturing early is that you reduce that risk of not producing any offspring. And this is going to be particularly important when mortality rates are really high, like in that graph we saw of the fish. When mortality rates are really high, adults have a higher chance of dying before they reproduce. And that's going to tend to cause selection for an earlier uh, age of, of first reproduction, so an earlier age of, at maturity. So what's the solution to these optimization problems? When should we mature and begin reproducing? How many should we reproduce? How many offspring should we produce? Well, in all of these cases, the answer is whatever is going to maximize the lifetime reproductive output or the net reproductive output. Now, yet another reproductive dilemma or another life history dilemma that organisms must face is how many times should they reproduce? So we just talked about when they should start reproducing. Once they start re reproducing, though, how many times should they do that? Uh, and this is an issue of parity, so the number of reproductive events. And there are really two options. Organisms can be iteroparous and exhibit iteroparity, uh, which is when they have repeated reproduction or reproductive events over and over and over again, like a lot of longer lived species. Uh, or they may be semilparous and exhibit semilparity. And this is where they will have one episode of reproduction. Sometimes it's also referred to as Big Bang reproduction because the organisms do all their reproduction all at once. Now, semel parity it tends to be very common among annual plants and animals that have a very short lifespan and a life, basically a life cycle very much like an annual plant where they, they're they born, they grow, they reproduce, they die. And they do that all in a very short period of time, usually less than a single growing season or a single breeding season. Um, this strategy is rare, so semel parity is rare among longer lived organisms, however, but there are some instances where we do see semel parity in longer lived organisms, and those are generally the more interesting cases from an evolutionary uh, standpoint. Now, semel parity with this Big Bang reproduction often involves programmed death. It's happening right at the end of the organism's lifetime. They're only going to reproduce once. It's, this is it. It's now or never. And so what we often see is there's a sort of adaptive breakdown of the body, of uh, programmed cell death. And this just sorts of gets all the resources possible that maybe we're going to be used to make sure your kidneys don't fail or some other organs didn't fail. Um, but you're about to die anyway, so you just take everything you can and you put it all into reproduction. Um, and then th these are just some examples of semelparous plants and animals. And we're going to talk about two uh, specific examples, one plant and one animal here. So the really interesting semel paris organisms are those long-lived organisms. These are organisms that actually go several years usually um, without reproducing and then right at the end of their life there's this big bang reproduction event. So one really cool example from the plant uh, world are agaves. There are several more than several, really, um, species of semelparous agaves. Uh, they usually grow in deserts, and they start off like this. They, this is what an agave looks like. Um, and they grow, and they look like this often for many years, sometimes 20 to 30 years. Um, 
before they flower, which of course is the first part of reproduction for a plant. Um, and what, but when they do that, when they initially then begin the final stages of their life to reproduce, they produce this enormous stock um, because they have been saving up energy and storing water as well that they can then use during this very short period to maximize their reproductive output. And once this stock is produced with the flowers on it, the flowers get pollinated and fertilization occurs, the fruits form, and after the seeds are finally produced and mature and these fruits, those plants, the adult plant dies and that's the end of their life. Now in the animal kingdom, probably the most famous example of a semelparous uh, animal that is relatively long lived, lives a couple of years, are salmon. And salmon have a really amazing uh, life trajectory. So they are born in these freshwater streams, often quite a good distance inland. After they are born, they swim out to the ocean and they have a huge sort of migratory path uh, where they will then spend the vast majority of their life out in the ocean. Um, and during this time, they can grow quite quickly over their few years of life, um, but they don't reproduce at that time. They're just growing. They're gathering resources, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then finally, um, when they're a couple years old, they make this long voyage back into the freshwater stream, so out of the ocean, and back all the way to the place where they first were born, where they spawned. And when they get there, they reproduce and they die. Now, in this case, because they have to make this incredible journey that often in involves, you know, it's traveling, they're traveling upstream against the current. And in many cases, they've got to jump up waterfalls uh, to get home you know, for, to the place where they are going to respawn and lay their eggs. So this journey and back is incredibly costly. And it's likely that because this journey is so hard and costly, that it's really only worth doing it once. And because of that, these salmon basically begin to break down parts of their body and sort of recycle bits of themselves. And you can see the change in what these salmon look like from when they're out in the ocean to when they make their way back inland to spawn. Um, they undergo that programmed death just as the semelparis agaves do as well. So really an incredible organism with an incredible life history. Now, why does seminal parity evolve? This is actually a question of active research right now. And basically, we, the, in many ways, we don't really know why. Um, however, it seems, of course, that it must be the case that it will evolve if it's beneficial to maximize reproduction all at once. And essentially, if that net reproductive output can be maximized or increased um, by being semelparous. Now, in terms of the cases where it would be beneficial to maximize reproduction all at once, there are a couple of instances where we think semelparity might be a good strategy and um, lead to increased fitness. So in the first case, if your chance of surviving to reproduce produce again is very low, um, then there's no need to say to hold back when you're reproducing. There's going to be selection for you to just use every resource at your disposal uh, to maximize reproduction at that one time. 
if reproduction is very costly, like it is for the salmon, they have to travel those amazingly long distances um, to do so. In their case, probably sur surviving uh, to reproduce again, if they had to swim back out to the ocean, would be very low. And so it's sort of a combination of these probably leads to the reason that salmon have evolved semel parity. So the third uh, way that semel parity may evolve are in cases where reproductive success is highly variable over time. And those favorable conditions that are very rare are still predictable though from some environmental cue. So what do I mean like, by that? Well, this probably uh, explains semel parity in agaves, but agaves live in a desert. And generally conditions are dry and not good for germinating seedlings. So most of the time it would be a waste of resources to try to reproduce because all your little seedlings would die. But occasionally in the desert, you get these rain events that are not, not really normal, not average events, but they cause the conditions to be wetter than normal. They're rare, um, but they happen. And a plant can probably sense when these events occur. When all of a sudden the soil gets really wet, um, wetter than it may do in say even a period of 20 years, that could be an indicator to a species that now is a favorable time to put all your little seeds out there uh, because this is the best this environment gets in terms of germinating. So those sorts of conditions could lead for uh, lead to selection for semel parity in things like agaves. If the organism can time their reproduction to those rare favorable events that will lead to a maximization of the number of of offspring surviving.